Hello, my name is Frank Archuleta, Wildfire Specialist for Wright Service Corps, and we're here today to talk about wildfire safety and prevention. Our goals for this course are employee and community safety. If we were to start a fire during our daily activities, that could threaten not only our employees, but the communities where we work. So we're here today to talk about how do we prevent and avoid these kind of incidents. All right, let's start. So when we're talking about wildfire safety or any other kind of safety, really, whether it was chainsaw safety, driving safety, all safety really begins with awareness. And that's not just what's going on around me, but it's getting information to prepare myself for the day. Do I have the, the weather forecast so I know what the conditions will be? Do I know what the fire danger level forecast will be? Have I shared this with all my employees until we all have that same level of awareness? Until we all know what's going on in our job site, we all know what the plan is, and we all know how to, to react in case any kind of incident should occur. That's the kind of awareness I'm talking about. We also want to talk about prevention and suppression measures. Mostly we're going to talk about prevention. If we can prevent fires and we don't have to spend any time suppressing them. If we should start a small fire, then we definitely want to know how would we put that out. But mostly what we're going to talk about today would be prevention. So the, the cost of fires can be very real, very serious. The photo we're looking at here is Paradise, California. The campfire occurred here in late 2018. This was caused by power lines in contact with vegetation. On a hot, dry day, those, those, that vegetation was throwing off sparks and they started a fire that, that end up, it ended up devastating this entire community. In reality, fires of this size are actually pretty rare, but they can happen. When the conditions are right, you can have this kind of, of, of damage and destruction. So we have, to keep, we have to take this very seriously and we have to figure out what are the steps we're going to do to prevent these kind of injuries, these kind of incidents in our daily job. It's important to remember that we are not firefighters. We want to, if a fire should break out, we want to call 911 as soon as possible. Get the professionals there, get them to do their job. We want to do our job and suppress it as quickly as possible. But if a fire should escape control, our job is to keep our employees safe, to get out of there and get the real firefighters there as quickly as possible. So we want to start off by talking about fire danger level, right? This is the potential for a fire to start and spread. This depends a lot on, on the kind of fuels you have around there. So sometimes when, when stuff's a little bit moist, you can light it on fire, but it's just not, it's not dry enough that it's really going to spread. But when you start getting to these very, very high and very extreme fire danger levels, what that means is stuff is really ready to burn. And any fire that starts out there really has a potential to take off, a very high potential. So we're looking here at this seven day significant fire potential map. Anybody out there can look at this. All you got to do is a, a Google search for seven day fire potential, and this is what will come up. This map right here is uh, um, uh, the fire danger level of the United States. Now, for some reason, some people use fire potential. Some people use fire danger level. Some people use fire, fire rating, fire index. In this course, I'm going to use fire danger level, but in general, they all mean the same thing. Don't ask me why we have so many different names for the same thing. But here we're looking at the fire potential map. And as you can see, most of this map is green and yellow. Right now at this time of the year, we haven't got to, to those really bad fire times. But later in the summer, some of these parts of this map are going to turn to orange and even red. When I start seeing that, what that's telling me is I need more information. This map up here, you can see up right, at, right here in this line right here, you've got uh, seven days of forecast. If I'm looking at today, that's likely to be fairly accurate. But if I'm looking out seven days, yeah, it's pretty hard to, to, to forecast accurately what the, what the fire potential will look like in seven days. But it does give me a, a good idea of what's, what's coming my way and allows me to prepare myself. Over here on the left side, you can see those, those regional areas. If you click on those, that'll take you, it'll zoom into the area of the, of, the, of the country you're working, and it'll give you a little bit more information. So we start off with this map here. It's kind of showing me the national fire danger level. I can zoom into the area I want to, but in reality, this map is not super accurate. It's giving me a good idea, and that's that's enough. Then I need to know what, what is my local fire danger. Sometimes the local fire danger signs look just like this. If you, if you live in the Western United, United States, chances are you've seen these signs because they're very common in, in many communities. But other parts of the country, you don't see them so much. So sometimes if I want to get this information, I've got to do a search for my state. In this instance, I'm using Texas. I put in, if I was to do a Google search for a Texas fire danger level, that map there on the left would come up. And I can look at that, and that's telling me that same information as that Smokey the Bear sign. It's, it's going 
the fire danger level from low to extreme. N not every state has one of these maps though, so if I can't find it there, I could also call the local fire department and ask them if they have that kind of information. If they're not able to give that to me, then I can look at this WFAS fire danger rating. I can do a Google search for that and that'll take me to the map on the right. That right there is the same kind of map. For some reason, they all have different names and they all have different colors, but they're giving me the same, same information. That map on the right is giving me the fire danger class for low through extreme. And if I'm not able to find the information anywhere else, I can always use this map right here. All you got to do is put in WFAS.net and look for fire danger rating, and that'll take you to that map right there. But it's important that we know on a daily basis during the fire season, what is the fire danger level? They call it different names, but it's all the same thing. It's the potential for a fire to start and to spread. So for those of you who work for PG&E out in the Right Tree Service of the West, Division 37, PG&E uses their own system as well. They use what they call the fire potential index map. That's this map we're looking at right here. And instead of using low through extreme, they use R1 through R5 and R5 plus to describe the danger level. This map is emailed, emailed daily to our supervisors working in this part of the country, and the supervisors there are supposed to share this information with all their employees. That way we start off the day knowing what is the fire danger level and how are we going to prepare. So going back to this fire danger level, we're going to start off with the, with, the, with the scale that most people use, which is low through extreme. So when I'm seeing low fire danger level out there, what it means is really stuff just does not want to burn. For whatever reason, it's probably wet and it's just, it's just really not going to even start on fire or it might start up a little bit, but it's just not going to spread very much. But as I start getting over there to high, what that means is that stuff is dried out now and it's ready to burn. It's probably not going to spread that fast because there's probably not a lot of wind at this point, but stuff is dry and if I have enough fuel, it might burn very hot. In these situations, it's probably not a high enough fire danger level to really burn down a community or burn down a large area but it could damage somebody's property, a yard, a garage, a fence, stuff like that. Fires can definitely burn hot at this point in time. They just don't generally spread too fast. But when I start getting to very high and extreme fire danger levels, what that means now is not only is stuff dry, but now I've added wind to this equation. Now I've got, I've got dry, windy conditions, and if a fire starts and if it has the right kind of fuels, there's a very good chance it could get out of control. For extreme conditions, usually what that means is I'm getting winds of greater than 20 miles per hour, continuous winds. For very high conditions, what that means is I'm probably getting winds somewhere in the range of 10 to 20 miles per hour. Again, continuous winds. That may not sound like a whole bunch when you're moving down the, the interstate in your car, but for a fire moving 50 to 20 miles per hour can be a very devastating thing. So this is the kind of stuff we want to focus on here is these very high in these extreme conditions. How do we prepare for these? Here's the PG&E scale. You can see it's just slightly different. They have one extra step in there, but it's essentially the same thing. So we started off, we looked at that national map. Then we went to go figure out what is the local fire danger. That's what the local fire professionals are saying the danger level is around here. But that area might cover a whole county, right? And we need more specific information. When we get to a job site, I need to know not what is the fire danger level for this state or for this county, I need to know this area right here where I'm working, what is the fire danger level? That's the only way for me to be prepared. And the way we'll do that is with a fire briefing. So the fire briefing is going to collect the information we see there on the left. It's going to start off with receptive fire fuels. By receptive fire fuels, I mean things that are dry enough to burn and that are dense enough to carry a fire. So sometimes you might show up to a job site and you got a little patch of vegetation here and you got a little patch of vegetation there. They may be dry and they may burn well individually, but they're not going to really carry a fire. If they get caught, if they catch on fire, they're going to burn up and go out. But when they get dense enough to carry a fire, when they get dry enough to really burn, that's when I really need to take note of those conditions. And when I see those kind of conditions, I'm also going to think about what is the wind doing? What's the wind speed and what's the wind direction? I also need to think about what is the relative humidity? How dry is the air out there? And what is the temperature? So when I see that, if I get up to a job site and I see that there's a lot of stuff that, that can burn, I need to know how windy, how dry, and how hot it is, how hot it is, because that's going to tell me just how dangerous the this job site is. It's going to tell me what the fire danger level is. So we'll talk more about these briefings here in a minute. 
let's go back to these very high and extreme fire fire danger conditions. So one thing to remember about these these conditions is for most parts of the country, these conditions only exist for a couple of weeks out of the year. Now you might get a drought or you might get a, a heat wave that extend this, but generally speaking, we're talking about two weeks out of the year in some parts of the country, it's only gonna be a couple of days. It might be two or three days, but whatever it is during this time, the potential for a fire to, to start and spread is very, very high. And we need to think about how are we gonna respond? What are we gonna do differently to prevent fires and to keep our people safe? One of the first things we can think about is just changing work locations. If it's an extreme fire danger day and I show up to a job site, I'm working in a meadow where it's just very dry grass and there's a lot of traffic driving back, uh, driving back and forth, then I might want to think about, can I go work someplace different? The other thing I might do is I might work there in the morning. I show up early in the morning while it's still cool, before the wind's picked up, before the day, before the everything is dried out, I can go there and work for four or five hours and get out before the afternoon when I know it's going to get hotter and drier. I may need to use a fire watch. We'll talk more about this later on, but this is a person whose job may be just to be on the job site, have a fire extinguisher nearby, have a tool nearby. In the event of a fire, they're going to be prepared to put it out as soon as it starts. When the conditions are that high, sometimes that's what it takes. I may use hand tools. I may have to stop work. Now, generally speaking, we don't have to do this. We can figure out a way to work safely. But sometimes the only option is, is to stop work when the, when the conditions are that bad. First of all, we want to think about what else can we do to keep ourselves safe during this two to three weeks, maybe two, three days, whatever whatever your region gets, uh, very high and extreme fire, fire danger conditions. What are we going to do to stay safe? Something that goes along with the very high and extreme conditions would be a red flag warning. Now, what this is is a forecast for conditions that for that are ideal for wildfire ignition and rapid spread to exist within 24 hours. You can see those conditions right there on the left. It's going to be wind speeds, continuous wind speeds of greater than 20 miles per hour. That's going to be the same pretty much no matter where in the country you go. But the relative humidity, it's going to be less than 20 percent. That's generally true in the western United States. But if you go to any of the kind of the, the 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 parts of the country around the Gulf of Mexico, even the East Coast, sometimes that's going to be different. Sometimes it'll be be less than 30 percent. Sometimes it'll be less than 40 percent. Different places have to kind of have a, diff, a different uh, a, a different level of humidity where it becomes critical. But what we need to know is when do these red flag warnings occur? So this video right here that we're going to watch. This took place in Bastrop, Texas a few years back. This fire took place on a day during red flag conditions. Very dry, very windy. And these are exactly what these fires can look like. You can see how fast these kind of fires can move. You see how, how, how dangerous and how destructive they can be. That's exactly why we're thinking about in these conditions, how are we going to avoid a situation like this? What are we going to do differently? You can see some of these individual trees in the back starting to burn up. When they're doing that on a day like this, those embers are getting caught in that rising heat and sometimes they'll get trapped in the wind and they'll get carried out in front of that main fire and start new fires called spot fires. That's, that's one of the things that make these kind of conditions so, so dangerous is it's not just that main flame front we can see right there in front of us, but there's also the potential for new fires to be started out sometimes 10, 12 miles out in front of the main fire. They can move that quickly and they can move that far. That's what makes them so dangerous. In a situation like these, even professional firefighters wouldn't try to put out that fire. What they're going to do is they're going to wait for the conditions to change. They're going to wait for the wind to die down. They're going to wait for some kind of moisture. They're going to wait for something that's going to change that's going to allow them to work safely. And we want to do the same thing, only we're going to decide what that change is going to be. We're going to figure out what are we going to do differently during times like this to make sure that all of our guys stay safe. So 
So here's a few statistics about that Bastrop fire. This ended up burning almost, well, 34,300 acres. It was caused by sparks from a power line, vegetation in contact with the power line. Almost 1,700 homes were destroyed in this time. This is a small community. 1,700 homes burning up is a real tragedy. There were four fatalities. So th this this cost this community dearly. And it, it was it was during this kind of event that the, it was very dry. The wind was was really was really whipping out there, and we got a spark. That's all it took. That's all it took was to get, was to get that fire ignited, and it took off, and it did all this damage to the community. This is the kind of stuff we need to think about. This is the kind of stuff we need to be aware of and avoid. So let's do a quick review about fire danger level. We were just talking about that. So fire danger level is it the level of water in a fire tank, the potential for a fire to start and spread. Smoothing out a fire to make it level. What do you think? I'm saying A, the potential for a fire to start and spread. So remember, we know that fire danger level, we can get it from our local fire department, or we can see that sign out there in, in, in front of fire departments or throughout the community sometimes. If we don't see it there, then I can go to the state website. The, the example I used earlier was Texas fire danger. I just Googled that. And I, I checked the site that came up and it gave me that information. What's the local fire danger level? Or I can go to this site right here, WFAS.net, and click on the fire danger rating tab. And that'll take me to that map that'll show me the entire country. Uh, what is the fire danger rating? But we need to have this information. This is part of that awareness we need. I need to know on a daily basis, what is that fire danger level going to be? That tells me what kind of steps I need to take to prepare. So we also talked about red flag warnings. So is a red flag warning worry that the flag is about to fall in red paint, a bright light making the flag look red, or ideal conditions for wildfire ignition and spread forecast within 24 hours? I'm going to say C. Ideal conditions for wildfire ignition and spread forecast for within 24 hours. Remember, we're talking about are very strong winds, continuous winds greater than 20 miles per hour, and very dry conditions. Depending on where you are, the conditions are going to be less than 20 to 40 percent. So, all right, so let's talk about prevention. We talked about you know, some of the damage that fire can do and, and the danger levels. How do we prevent these kind of situations from occurring? So what we have here is the fire triangle. Those are the three ingredients you need to have a fire, oxygen, heat, and fuel. So in order to prevent fires, what we need to do is we need to go onto our job site and figure out what kind of fuels do we have out here? What kind of stuff could burn? And what kind of ignition sources? What, what out here is hot enough to start that fire, that, those fuels on fire? If we can identify those and separate those, then we can prevent fires. And it, it sounds a little easier here than it is in, in, in practice, but really that's what it boils down to. On our job site, what out here can burn and what out here is hot enough to start it on fire? If we can identify those and separate those, we're going to be safe. So let's talk about the fuels. We thought we already talked a little bit about receptive fire fuels. I said that's uh, stuff that is dry enough and continuous enough, dense enough to carry a fire. And mostly what we're talking about here is for, is vegetation. But a lot of people out there never work in sites like this picture in the on the screen right now. A lot of people work pretty much in the city. And in the city, you may not see something like this. But if you're working in an alley, if you're working in a backyard. A lot of times in those situations, you'll see a lot of piled up boxes. You'll see a lot of piled up newspapers. And when those things get dry, all it takes is a spark to set that stuff on fire. So when we're talking about receptive fire fuels, it's really anything out there that's going to burn. Anything else that's going to that's going to carry a fire into someplace that we don't want it to go. So we're talking about fire fuels. We want to think about three things mostly. We want to think about what type is it? What's the moisture level and what's the density? You can see in this photo right here that uh, we, we've got some very tall grass. You can see it's very dry and it's very thick. If I was working here on, here on a day where the fire danger level was extreme and I had to go out in that field, I've really got to think twice about that. I've got to think about what's my escape route out of there if something was to go wrong. When I'm not using those hot tools, where am I going to set them down? I certainly don't want to set them down in that grass. Where am I going to park my vehicle? How am I going to manage all those fuel source, uh, all those ignition sources while I'm while I'm surrounded by this fuel source? And like I said, sometimes we can go in in the morning and work safely until it gets till the till the heat of the day, but when it starts to get really hot, dry, and windy out there, it, the best thing for us is to avoid these kind of situations. So let's talk a little bit more about type. 
moisture, and density. The fuel type we're most concerned about are called one hour fuels. They're also called fine fuels, and this is any fuel with a diameter of less than a quarter inch. Grasses, shrub, leaves, twigs, and the real issue with this kind of stuff is that they can dry out really quickly. And it, when, they're, when they're dry and it's hot enough, it doesn't take a whole lot to start them on fire. So think about when you're starting a campfire, what do you use to get that going? You don't throw big sticks on there. You don't throw big logs on there. You throw these fine one hour type fuels on there and you put your bigger fuels above those so that heat will catch that stuff on fire. That's exactly what happens in a wildfire. Almost always what happens is these one hour fuels catch on fire and spread to something else. So the reason they call them one hour fuels is because it usually takes them about one hour to dry out. Unless they're completely soaking wet, uh, these, these kind of things can dry out in about an hour. And I'm sure you've all seen this. You showed up in the morning, there was a bit of dew on the ground and the sun came up and it just kind of disappears. It does not take it that long, especially if you get some sun in a situation like this, especially if you get the wind blowing, it's gonna dry that stuff right out. And a lot of times, That'll fool people. They think, well, we got a rain last night. We got a, a you know, rain this morning. That might be enough. But remember, these kind of things can change really quickly. That's what makes them so potentially dangerous. So we talked about fuel fuel types. These little kind of fine fuels that can that can start up really easy and can dry out really easy. Fuel moisture. This is really just based upon how much rain have, have we had recently. How much rain is going to determine what's the relative humidity. That means how much moisture is in the air. When we don't get any rain, that air starts to dry out, and that dry air is just going to suck the moisture right out of these fuels, drying them out. As the fuel moisture drops, the fire potential is going to increase. So when we show up at a job site, it shouldn't take us that long to think about this stuff, right? We take a quick walk through the job site, and we can figure out what's the fuel type, what's the fuel moisture. We can also figure out what's the fuel density. The denser that fuel is, the more, the, the more intense fire is, is possible. So when we put all that stuff together, if you, get out, if you get out of your vehicle and you do a quick search of the job site, right away you should be able to figure out what is the type, what is the moisture, what is the density. That's going to tell me a lot about the fire danger level on that site, right? If I show up and this is a paved field or it's green grass that is mown down, mown down short, then I'm not going to worry about it too much. But if I see something like this, then I've got some other questions I need to answer. Let's, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. So we're talking about fire prevention. We're talking about what on the job site could catch on fire and burn, and what out there is hot enough to catch it on fire. We were just speaking about fuels. Let's go ahead and talk about ignition sources. So ignition sources are anything with sufficient heat to ignite those receptive fuels that we're talking about. Now, when the temperature gets really hot, 95, 100, over 100, then the, the amount of heat you need to ignite those fuels goes way down. But if it's 50, 60 degrees out there, it's going to take a little bit more energy to start those fuels on fire. So the hotter it is outside, the easier stuff is going to start on fire. It's important to remember that almost all wildfires are caused by people one way or the other. Vehicles are a huge source of, of, of wildfires. Bad poorly adjusted brakes, worn out brakes throwing sparks off, Somebody pulling a trailer down the road with something dragging on it, safety chains dragging, vegetation coming in contact with utility lines. You can see in this picture right here, somebody burning some, some yard waste in their yard. This guy's not thinking about starting a fire, but did he think about the conditions today? Is he ready for the wind to pick up around noon? And a situation like this, you know, when the conditions are right, it's very easy for these kind of fires to get away from people and harm people around them. So when we're talking about wildfire safety, it's not just what's going on on our job site. We want to be very aware of what's going on in the world around us. What's the traffic doing? What are our neighbors doing? What is going on around us that could potentially start a fire that could potentially trap our employees? We need to, that's part of that awareness as well, is what's going on in the world around me. So when we talk about ignition sources, these kind of are utility related ignition sources, electrical conductors, vehicles, equipment and tools. The electrical conductors, this is a lot of energy. If a spark from a from a worn out brake can start a fire, then a down power line can start a fire and that, that no amount of sparks off a brake possibly could. There's a lot of heat and energy. When you get vegetation that's that's making contact with those power lines and throwing sparks off, really it's, it's just waiting for the right conditions to start a fire. If we see these kind of conditions, especially if we're not working on them, 
It's important that we call a utility and report these. Let's call our supervisor. And if there was some kind of public safety hazard, if I saw a down power line, I thought there was a chance for it to start a fire or that there was anybody around that that could possibly get shocked. Not only, not only am I going to call the utility, but I might need to call the police to come secure the area. I might need to call the fire department if I thought there was going to be a fire. So these kind of situations, I don't want to just walk by them. I want to report them as quickly as possible to whoever I think is appropriate, but definitely starting with the utility company. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to stay on the scene. I'm going to stay back from those down power lines. I'm going to keep myself safe, but I'm going to put myself in a position where I'm safe. And if anybody comes close, I can warn them off until the utility gets there, until the police or the fire department get there. So for ignition sources here, we have vehicles. I feel like this is probably one of the highest risks for right tree. We have a lot of people that have to park in these kind of conditions every day where you have that vegetation underneath and you have the, the heat from the muffler or the motor or the brakes that could potentially light that on fire. So the best thing to always do is whenever possible, I want to park on a, on a hardened surface. I want to park on pavement. I want to park on soil. I want to park somewhere where there is no vegetation around. By doing that, I'm breaking that fire triangle and, I, and I'm preventing a fire from happening. If for some reason I need to park on vegetation, then I need to think about putting down a fire blanket, also called a welding blanket. I put that underneath the underneath my vehicle, so it's blocking the heat from that motor, from that exhaust system, and from those brakes from coming in contact with the vegetation. Now, sometimes the vegetation is really tall and it's gonna push that, that fire blanket up against the muffler. What I'm gonna need to do then is take a tool and cut that stuff down, clear it out of the way, and then put down the fire blanket. I also wanna make sure before I leave the yard in the morning, my load is secured, my tires are fuel full, and my vehicle is clean. This should be part of our 360 walk around, going around and making sure that these, these vehicles are in good working order and that they're ready for a day's work and, and that we're preventing wildfires. On bucket trucks, especially right behind the cab, I see a lot of places where vegetation builds up and it's sitting right over the muffler. As you're sitting there idling, as you're driving, that stuff is breaking down and falling onto that hot muffler and there is a potential for fire. So throughout the day, we need to be checking this stuff as well, making sure that uh, when we leave a job site, our truck is still in good condition, that it's clean, and we're doing everything we can to prevent any kind of wildfire ignition. So here's a little graphic here, six ways a vehicle can start a fire. They talk about severely worn brake pads, you know, metal on metal throwing sparks, the catalytic converter, and our bucket trucks, they go through the regen cycle and they can get up to 2000 degrees. That's a lot of heat. Now that's on the inside, but that heat has to go somewhere. And we've got to keep those trucks idling while we're driving. So that's putting out a lot of heat that could even dry up. Even if you're parked on wet grass, the heat from that, from that motor and that exhaust system could dry it all out in the time that we're working. So it's important that we're thinking about that. The hot engine, tire pressure. When you've got low tires, if they hit something, they could compress and throw a spark. It doesn't happen all that often, but it does happen. Exhaust system, if you're driving a UTV or an ATV, those things must have a spark arrestor. Dragging metal, those safety chains. It's important that if our, if our chains are too long, we adjust them to the right height, that we keep those things crossed. And if they're too long, what we do not do is twist them. We take out the bolt and adjust them to the right height. So our equipment and our trailers, very similar to the vehicles. We want to make sure this thing is attached to the vehicle properly, that the safety chains are properly attached, that anything that is on here, that our load is secured, that, that we're not getting a bunch of garbage build up on here. And shippers are very bad for this. Most, most pieces of equipment are, is, as you're running it, you're getting places on this equipment where dust, leaves, you know, little branches are building up on these chippers. Most of them, will, well, not most of them, they will all have a shield over the exhaust system, but still you can get branches falling in there. You get places in here inside the, uh, the engine compartment. You get other places where stuff collects and starts to heat up. Let's make sure we're keeping these things clean. Let's make sure we're keeping them in proper running order. Part of that again will be that 360 walk around. Part of that is our annual DOT inspection on these to make sure they're good in running order. But part of that is also just keeping an eye on them throughout the day and making sure everything is running the way it should. So let's talk about our chainsaws and any other gas power tools we may be using. So one thing about all these vehicles need is a spark arrestor. That is the law. Spark arresters, when they sit right in front of the exhaust port and after a while that thing is going to get full of carbon and it's going to block that exhaust 
and your equipment is not going to run properly. You can clean these things, but when you clean them, they're not going to block the sparks the way they should. That's just a big filter right there that's sitting in front of the exhaust port blocking sparks. What I've been trying to encourage everyone to do is set a date, April 1st, January 1st, whatever works for you. And on that date, we go through all of our chainsaws and all of our gas power tools and we, we replace the spark arresters. That way we know they're new, they're there, and that's one less thing for us to worry about. The other thing uh, that with, with chainsaws and gas power tools would be hot mufflers. When I'm not using that tool, where am I going to set that down? I don't want to put that hot muffler or that hot bar into grass. If I'm working in an area like that picture we were looking at earlier with the cow in the meadow, and there's no place without vegetation for me to set down that tool, then I need to take one of my hand tools and clear off an area 10 feet by 10 feet wide down to bare soil. And when I'm not using those, to those tools, I'm going to set that down with the muffler up so that he can escape. I'm also going to use that as my fueling area. But before I start that piece of equipment, I'm going to walk 10 feet away and start at 10 feet away from where I do the fueling. Another big concern for us could be the friction of a bar of the of the chain going over the bar, especially if you're doing some, uh, especially if you're cutting some kind of dead wood. A lot of times that friction in there, if you're doing some kind of cross cut or anything, it's going to build up enough heat that could get that 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 dead wood to smoldering. So take your time, pull the saw out, let it cool off. Once you've made your cut, get in there and uh, uh, and feel feel that and make sure that's not too hot. If we have to, we can throw some dirt on it. We can put some water on it. We can kind of scrape it up with the tool and monitor it, making sure that we know that area got hot. We're going to go do the rest of our work. In a few minutes, we'll come back. We'll keep an eye on that to make sure that's not starting any kind of fires. So let's do a review about fire prevention. Fire prevention is identification and separation of fuel and ignition sources, identif identification and separation of power sources, Mixing fuel and ignition sources. I'm going to go ahead and say A, identification and separation of fuel and ignition sources. So let's talk about the fuel sources. We want to know the three things that we need to know about our fuel sources are type, density, and color, density, moisture, and brand, or type, moisture, and density. I'm going to go ahead and say C, type, moisture, and density. We want to think about the, the type are those one hour fuels, also called fine fuels, stuff like grass and shrubs and leaves, the stuff that can dry out really quickly, the stuff that when it is dry, sometimes it just takes the littlest spark on those things and they can get going. I want to think about the moisture level of that fuel and I want to think about how dense it is. Let's talk about ignition sources. Our ignition sources, electrical conductors, Vehicles, equipment, and tools. Vehicles, tools, monkeys, and cheese. Equipment, vehicles, tools, and aliens. Again, I'm going to say A. Electrical conductors, vehicles, equipment, and tools. When I'm on a job site, when I show up, I need to identify all those fuel sources. I also need to think about where am I going to park my vehicles? Where am I going to set my tools? How could those? How could all those ignition sources possibly come in contact or affect those fuel sources enough to catch them on fire. If I'm thinking about that, if I'm keeping that stuff separated, if I'm going back and monitoring anything I've cut to make sure that it didn't build up enough heat to catch it on fire, I'm going to be okay.